Hello, fourth graders. Mr. B again. And two more chapters from Captain Kid's Cat by Robert Lawson. <clears throat> so as you will recall, <clears throat> things were not going so well for the Adventure Galley. And uh, McDermott had said there was times he almost wished he'd stayed in New York and taken his chances with Madam Kid. So now we get to chapter six, Mutiny. <clears throat> we cruised around pretty aimless for some weeks, while the sick ones slowly got better. Even when they were all able for duty, we only had two-thirds of a crew, and that a surly, discouraged lot. They really had good cause to grumble. We'd been out for almost a year now without a single capture. Nobody had earned a farthing for his labors. Being about time for the coming of the Mecca fleet, the captain made for the Red Sea entrance, where we laid up for three weeks at Bab's Key waiting for him. There just might be a chance to cut out a prize flying French colors. This was the spot where the pirates usually laid in wait for the Pilgrim fleet, but this year there were none. They probably knowing we were there and not wanting to embarrass Bill. There may be hotter places in the world than Bab's Key, but if so, I've never seen them. Stewing and fuming in that heat for three weeks had everyone in a nasty state of temper by the time the fleet showed up. Eighteen or twenty sail of promising-looking merchantmen. But the tempers were fit to bust when we saw they were being convoyed by two powerful men of war, flying English and Dutch colors. Howso, uh, howsomever, uh, Bill sent most of the crew below so we wouldn't look like a pirate craft and steered right in among them, bold as brass. We ran alongside a smallish merchantman manned by Armenians, they had a linguister on board who hailed us in English. Ahoy there, Bill calls. Have you, by any chance, a good cur turkey carpet for sale? Five by seven yards, colors mostly blue. I will pay top price. Well, they were pretty mistrustful of our being pirates, but being sharp merchants, of course, they couldn't miss the chance of a sale. So they busied around, and before long they hung a rug over the rail and began to jabber. I couldn't tell about the size, but it did look to be in good condition, and the color mostly blue. Bill, eyeing it through his glass, was real excited. Close her a bit more, quartermaster, he says. It looks as though this were it, Mac. What a relief that would be. What a relief. A little closer, if you please, quartermaster. Five by seven yards exact, the linguister balls. Two hundred pieces of eight. And a bargain. At that minute, there came a series of roars astern of us. A round shot tore through our topsail, and two others sent up a cloud of spray that wet down our quarter deck. The quartermaster heaved over the helm, and we sheered off at top speed. As we swung, I could see the two men of war bearing down almost on our stern. They sent a few more shots after us, but they went wide, and we were soon well clear of the fleet. Bill was hopping mad. A dastardly outrage, he shouts. What a way to treat an honest king's ship, attempting a bit of legitimate trading. Had I been on my own, I would have taken on both of them. And that confounded carpet almost in my grasp. But if Bill was mad... The crew was even madder. Moore, the gunner, was the worst of the lot. He hadn't ever gotten over the cholera and was down most of the time. But he could still talk. He could talk plenty. What a cruise, he rants. And what a captain. Twelve blistering months and not a penny earned. A third the crew lost, and now him risking our lives for his blasted silly carpet. Any captain worth a bucket of bilge would have made our fortunes in less time than this and with half the loss. I'm for the Jolly Roger, and real swag I am. To the sharks with Dutch William's fancy commission. 
The bosun and some of the steadier men talked him down, but a good many of them agreed with him. One was Bradenham, the sawbones. His rum had given out some time before, and he had the shakes bad. I'd seen enough mutinies to smell one brewing, and I smelled it now. Strong. It came out a bit very shortly. We came across a small ship with a Portuguese master and an Armenian crew. Kid has the master brought aboard to show his papers, and they're all in order. No Frenchies on board, no French pass. So Bill has him rowed back to his ship, first, of course, asking if he had a turkey carpet aboard, which he hadn't. It seems Bradenham had stowed himself aboard our gig, and when they got back to the Portuguese, him and our boat's crew went aboard and ransacked her, looking for rum, mostly. Finding none, they came off with a bale of coffee, a bale of pepper, and a ball of beeswax to pay for their trouble. Of course, Bill balled them out proper, which they took real sullen. It's only worth a few doubloons, Bradenham mutters, but at least it's something. Maybe it'll change our luck. It may well change yours, Mr. Bradenham, Bill says. You have committed an act of piracy, for which you may pay with your neck. Not that that would be any great loss to the medical profession. We went on with our footless cruise, our luck getting worse, if anything. The adventure galley was leaking bad now, the pumps going night and day her bottom so foul that she was very crank handling. We'd sighted nary a pirate ship. Fact is, for weeks at a time we sighted no ship of any kind, much less a rich prize. The crew was getting sullener and more mutinous every day. Being short-handed and doing extra duty at the pumps in that full blistering heat was no help either. To make things no better, our water was running low, so the captain put into Karawar to water. There was a Royal East India trading post there, and Kidd had himself rowed ashore to inquire about that everlasting carpet. As usual, he found none that suited, but he did get news that brought him boiling back to the ship at top speed. It seems that two powerful Portuguese men-of-war were cruising these waters, and, as luck would have it, had run across the little merchantman that our men had robbed. Her captain had branded us as pirates and told a great tale of how his men had been triced up in the rigging and beaten with cutlasses and him looted of a chest of gold and jewels. The story had spread all over these parts, getting bigger and bloodier as it spread. And now the two Portuguese men of war were scouring the seas for those bloodthirsty pirates, meaning us. Before we were half-watered, Bill had the anchor up and made for the open sea, not wanting to be caught in that rat trap of a harbor. He was fair simmering. The adventure galley, a pirate ship, he stormed. Kid, the freebooter. Warships on our trail. The whole coast up in arms, and all over a miserable bale of coffee, a bale of pepper, and some beeswax. Where is that imbecile sought Bradenham? <clears throat> Down in the old, sir, as per usual, sir, the bosun says. Somehow he smuggled his beeswax ashore and traded it for a gallon of rum. He strictly non compass mentis, sir, not to say very horse to combat. There was no sign of a ship when we got to sea, so we stood on up the coast. But next morning, at daybreak, there suddenly looms up through the early mist a great towering Portuguese looking the size of Parliament House, and barely a pistol shot away. Without even a hail, she lets loose with six of her great guns, and all six shot go clean through us. So there's the Portuguese man of war, that's the large one, and there's the... Adventure Galley. Bill was the fightinest mad captain I ever I see. I began to take in now why he'd been such a holy terror to the Frenchies when he was a privateersman. 
He slammed over his helm, coasted across her stern, and gave her every gun of his port battery in turn. Eighteen of them, and every one a hit. It made a proper hash of her gilded stern castle and her steering gear. In a wind, she'd have been helpless then and there, but with our usual luck, there wasn't a breath. It was almost a dead calm. Bill had out the sweeps, and we crossed her wake again, giving her our starboard broadside. Had we had a full crew and a dependable one, we could have done her in. But short-handed as we were, we hadn't enough men to man the sweeps and the guns both, so we had to just drift along, getting in a shot now and then when we could. We fought her that way all day long, and by sunset had her cut up real bad while we hadn't taken another hit after the six she surprised us with. Bill was all for boarding and taking her, but the men refused flat out. Only Bill's rage and pride made him propose it, and he let it drop soon as he'd calmed down a bit. About sunset, a bit of breeze came up, and the Portuguese was glad to limp away as best she could. Her consort, that had been becalmed about a league away all day, joined her, and they drifted on up the coast. Bill stood on the poop, running sweat and all powder blackened, watching him go. He was still pretty well keyed up and happier than he'd been since we left New York. Well, Mac, he says, it was a good fight, wasn't it? Really refreshing. I warrant it will be a long time before any Portuguese tries his murdering deceitful tricks on a British ship in these waters. Bozen! A double ration of grog all around. The men drank their grog eager enough, but without any of the usual banter and horseplay. I could hear Moore going among them with his grumbling. More work and sweat and risk, he growls, and all for nothing, all for the glory of dear old England and the honor of his blasted majesty's flag, and not a farthing for them that sweats the sweat and takes the risks. I joined on to take prizes, not to fight warships for the fun of it. Bill overhears him and steps to the rail. All for nothing, you say, Mr. Moore? He asks, icy polite. Allow me to correct you. All because a rum-sodden swab of a doctor and some of your light-fingered friends were idiots enough to jeopardize the safety of this ship and its crew by robbing an unarmed Portuguese merchantman of some groceries and beeswax. Beeswax, indeed! An awe-inspiring aggregation of pirates you make. Terrifying, truly. The greengrocers and toffee vendors must quake in their boots when you step ashore. I thought I had a crew of seamen, not pickpockets. Now, you guard your mutinous tongue, my man, lest you find yourself in irons or dancing on thin air at the end of a hempen neckerchief. Darby Mullins and some of the others guffawed, but mostly the men just looked sullener and went below with their grousing. Beeswax! Beeswax! Bill busted out, pacing the deck. Just think of it, Mac. I have commanded privateers that could have taken yon two Portuguese before breakfast. Why, I own a fleet of merchantmen, the least of which is worth double this cursed tin pot galley. To think that I, William Kidd, one of the wealthiest, most respected merchant captains of New York, should be forced to consort with this crew of seagoing cut purses and Newgate sweepings. It's maddening! Maddening! He paces the deck some more till he calms down a bit. Then he picks me up and scratches my chin. Forgive me, old cat, if I appear boastful, he says, grinning a bit. But you are the only soul on board in whom I can confide. Your intelligence and understanding are a tremendous comfort to me. Now, suppose we turn in and pray that Providence will soon send us a fabulously rich French prize. The little water we'd taken on at Carawar soon gave out, and we had to put in at one of the Malabar Islands for more. I went ashore in the first boat to stretch my legs and try for a bird or two to vary my diet. It was a wild, desolate sort of spot, 
the only inhabitants being a particularly nasty, unfriendly tribe of savages. The boatman went off with the first load, leaving me and the cooper alone at the spring. I went into the brush and was stalking a nice, plump, young bull, when suddenly I smelled natives. Strong. I froze still and finally made out six or eight of them worming their way through the scrub. I slid out quiet and tried to warn the old cooper, but he was too busy puttering with his casks to pay me any mind. I clawed his arm hard, and he looked up, but too late. Before, I, before he could draw his cutlass, they were on him, and four of them had him spread-eagled out on the sand. One of the savages came stepping out of the brush now with a spear in one hand and a wicked-looking knife on the other. He was dressed in a three-stranded necklace of shark's teeth and bracelets of the same. I judged he was some kind of chief, being bigger and uglier than the rest. I hadn't the heart to watch what was coming, so I stepped back into the brush. There was a long, sickening scream from the old cooper that ended in a horrid, gurgling noise. Then the savages began to do one of their senseless dances, to whoop and sing, bashing in our water casks and raising old scratch generally. From where I was hid, I could see the adventure galley all astir, the men piling into the longboat and pulling hard for the shore. They came boiling out onto the beach, Bill and about twenty of the crew, all well armed. Used as they were to ugly sights, seeing the cooper give them quite a turn. Darby Mullins took it, in a, took it as special bad, him and the old cooper being close pals. Half the men fanned out on the, down the beach and dove into the scrub, while the rest, with Kid in the lead, took a sort of path that he judged led from the spring to the native's village. Soon there was a shot or two, some shouts and howls, and then a cloud of black smoke rose up over the jungle. I guessed our crew were burning the village. A while later they came back bringing with them a string of savages tied together with a length of line. They trussed them up secure to trees while they held a council to decide what to do about them. Darby Mullins was all for doing in the lot, but Bill thought they'd only ought to punish the actual killers, if they could pick them out. One of the natives who knew a bit of their heathen, or excuse me, one of our crew who knew a bit of their heathen tongue tried to question them, but got nowhere. I already, I'd already spotted the shark tooth one, him that, I did, him that did the knife work on the cooper, so I walked over and laid his calf open with a hearty rake. "'Good old McDermott!' shouts Kid. "'Men, the only eyewitness to this ghastly crime "'has clearly pointed out the murdering villain. "'No crown jury could have done better.' "'He was um, interrupted by the crash of Darby Mullins' pistol, "'and the chief slumped down in his bindings, dead as a haddock. "'They left the others tied to their trees while they finished the watering, "'sewed the cooper in a bit of sailcloth, and carried him out to the ship.' Then they untied him, gave him a good lashing, and booted him back into the jungle. Soon as we got well to sea, the captain calls all hands, reads the service, and the poor old cooper, with an eight-pounder ball at his feet, is slid over the rail. So that's a burial at sea. They sew him up in his own bunk, or in his own um, hammock. They sew him in, they put a a nice eight pound cannonball at the bottom because uh, that'll help keep the uh, body from floating goes to the bottom of the ocean that's a burial at sea that's uh, how a sailor gets buried a fine lucky cruise this is more growls as the men break up a lucky ship and a lucky captain too the bible spouting swab and a fine lucky ship's cat you wished on us, Mullins. He gave me a dirty look. Once I lay hands on that black-backed Jonah, I'll... Darby fetched him a swipe that laid him in the scuppers. Then he went aft and begged the captain for a tot of rum, which Bill gave him gladly. Now a Jonah is a person or a thing that brings a curse, bad luck, to a ship. Just in case you didn't know. 
everyone felt down in the mouth for a few days, the cooper being a fine old seaman and very popular. But the Monday following, they all cheered up mightily when a fine-looking merchantman showed up to the south of us. As she came closer, we could, we could see that she was a heavy-laden, well-kept ship, the best we had seen since the five East Indiamen at Johanna. She was flying Dutch colors and carried only a few deck guns. By the time she came abreast of us, the men were all armed and had two boats ready for, loyal, for lowering. Bill, who'd been studying her carefully through his glass, snapped it shut and leaned over the rail. "'Yon is the loyal captain of New York, Captain Hoare commanding,' he announces. "'Captain Hoare is a privateer and merchant captain. Also my good friend. She is no pirate vessel and certainly has no French pass. Captain Hoare would never sink to that. Therefore we have no call to question her, so make fast your boats.' and put aside your arms. Well, when he said this, mutiny really did break out. The men howled and jeered and went right on with their preparations to lower. Don't you want to search her for your blistering cop it? yells Moore. If you don't, we will. Bill leans over the rail and speaks again, very precise. You may take the boats if you will, he says. I am powerless to prevent it, but I can promise you this. Not a man of you will set foot on this deck again. I will sink your boats first, if I have to handle the guns myself. Moreover, I warn you, you will never board yon ship without the fight of your lives. Captain Hoare is a deadly fighter. He has successfully fought the best of the pirates and real seamen, not gutter sweepings. Well, that stopped them for a minute. They began to argue and squabble, some for, some against. The old pirate hands who had seen Hoare in action were against, to a man. Long before they'd settled on anything, the loyal captain was hull down in the distance, and Moore was raving with rage and the fever. Three men had to haul him down to his bunk, where Sawbones gave him a big slug of something to quiet him down. Chapter 7 The Bucket The next morning was fairly pleasant for these parts, less hot than usual and the air almost fresh. The men were in a little better humor, and Moore, the gunner, had managed to drag himself on deck. He looked in mighty bad shape, whether from the fever or Bradenham's dose, I couldn't say. Abel Owen had just dumped a bucket of swill overside and left the bucket to air while he enjoyed an after-breakfast pipe. I started to stroll over and investigate the bucket, when I suddenly felt a grip like a fish hawk's on the scruff of my neck. I knew it was more. It was the first time I'd ever been careless about him, and it was likely to be the last. Howsomever, I swiveled around and raked his forearm from elbow to wrist, going for the big vein. I didn't get it, worse luck, but he let out a yell and dropped me. As I hit the deck, he fetched me a kick and stove my ribs and sent me skittering ten feet. Bill had seen the whole business and was already down on deck. You dog, he roars, picks up the swill bucket and lets it fly at Moore's head. The gunner ducked, but not quite quick enough, and the bucket caught him a glancing clip on the side of the head. He went down on all fours, screeching like a stuck pig. He's murdered me, mates! He's murdered me! he yells. I call you all to witness! He killed me in cold blood! Loudest speaking corpse ever I see, Darby Mullen says with a laugh. Come, laddie, and leave us lay you out on your beer. So he and Owen hauled more below and dumped him in his bunk. Bill had me up in his arms and into the cabin before the others had even started to pick up more. He laid me out careful on his pillow, stroked me and felt me all over, gentle as any nurse. Once I got my wind back, I didn't feel too bad, but from Bill's poking I knew a couple of my ribs were cracked. Nothing serious, but I'd have to sleep a lot for a few days. So 
I began right then. All day, Bill and young Barleycorn took turns sitting and watching me, in case I should want anything, which I didn't, except sleep. Every once in a while, one of the crew came tiptoeing up to see how I was doing, and I was real touched when I woke up once in the night and saw Bill stretched out sleeping on a hard locker, not wanting to disturb me. Next morning, Bradenham comes to the captain to report. All ends well, sir, he says, except Moore, the gunner. He's dead. Moore? Dead, says Bill. What of? Oh, the cholera, Sawbones answers. I've been expecting it. Uh, that little clip I gave him with the bucket had nothing to do with it, Bill asks. Oh, no, no, no connection at all, says Sawbones, entirely due to the fever and, and a constitution undermined by years of alcoholic overindulgence. Well, let that be a lesson to you, surgeon, Bill says, and enters Moore's death in the log. Some weeks later, just a year and two months out of New York, we made our first capture. Our bad luck still holding true, it proved to be hardly worth the bother. It was a small moor merchantman, about 200 tons, bound from Surat to Malabar. She was flying French colors and had a French pass, so it was all legal and above board. Bill lets the moors go in their longboat and puts a prize crew aboard in charge of the quartermaster. The cargo was nothing much. Two Arab horses, some sugar, and a few bales of cotton. When the quartermaster finally managed to sell it to some coast natives, each man's share hardly amounted to enough to buy a twist of tobacco. It was funny, though, how much even that little cheered him up. Bill was pleased, too, for the adventure galley was so worm-eaten and leaky by now that she seemed likely to fall apart any day. He gave the quartermaster strict orders to stay close with us in case we had to abandon ship in a hurry. Then, one fine morning, when the crew had begun to grouse again, our bad luck streak finally broke with a bang. Nobody could hardly believe their eyes when we saw the beautiful sight. A big Bengal merchantman, 500 ton at least, heavy laden and plowing along, slow and easy under the French flag. Bill lost no time running up French colors and making for her. As we ranged alongside, they hailed us in French, all pleasant and unsuspecting as could be. They were taken flat aback when Bill hoisted the British flag and ordered the master aboard us. He arrives pretty soon, looking real chop-fallen, and says to Bill, So, you are English? Well, here is a good prize. Then he handed over his French pass. Bill read it carefully, showed the master his royal commission, and says, you are now my fair and legal prize. When he says this, our men all whoop and cheer fit to burst their throats, and Bill sends Barleycorn for the Madeira. The Frenchy drunk his like he needed it real bad. The new prize was called the Quida Merchant. Bill sent the bosun and some men aboard her. We made for the coast, set the, matter, or set the master and crew ashore, and wished them good luck. We were quite a little fleet now. The Quida Merchant, the Little Moor Prize, and the Adventure Galley. The old galley was so shaky that we'd had to wrap three cables around her hull to hold her together. So Bill decided to make for St. Mary's. I didn't like the idea, hating the steaming hold as I did, but it was the nearest port and we'd likely be undisturbed there. I didn't have any say in the matter anyway. As soon as he had time, Bill sent Brother Samuel aboard the prize to tot up the cargo. That was the one thing he was good for, being handy with figures. Good with lists and such like. When he finally came back with a rough estimate of the loot, it seemed too good to believe. There were several chests of plate, gold bullion, dust, and coin, as well as quite a few jewels. As for cargo... There was two or three hundred bales of silks, calicoes, and muslins, ninety tons of sugar, forty of saltpeter, and ten of iron, to say nothing of elephant ivory, spices, and other rich stuff. 
I've never seen a happier man than Bill. The minute Brother Samuel leaves, he picks me up and throws me to the ceiling two or three times. Luckily, my ribs were all well by now. He dances around the cabin like one touched, whooping, laughing, and singing. Do you realize what this means, Mac, he says? It's our ransom, old cat. It will buy our freedom from this cursed venture. We will be free again, Mac. Free! This one capture will pay back the investment of my rapacious, high-born employers and return them a worthwhile profit. It will reward the crew handsomely, what is left of them, and it will release me from my obligation. That is all the reward I ask. Think of it, Mac. To walk the cool, pleasant streets of New York once more. A carefree, upright, respected citizen. There was a knock on the door, and, and Brother Samuel appears again, looking bug-eyed with pleasure and excitement. And now, Brother William, he says with a deep bow and a flourish, the richest treasure of all. A couple of grinning seamen unrolled a big bale and spread it out on the deck, an elegant turkey carpet. Exactly five yards by seven to the inch, Brother Samuel says, proud as a mogul. The colors were mostly blue. It was in prime condition and the very top quality. I ought to know because I sharpened my claws on it for the rest of the cruise, and I know the feel of top-grade stuff. Won't Sister Sarah be pleased, says Brother Samuel, shivering a bit. Won't she, Bill says, with a sigh of relief that came all the way from his boot soles. Samuel, he goes on, I call you and these others to witness that I hereby renounce all claim to any part of the profits from the Quedaw merchant save only this rug. The doubloons and wadores, the silks and ivory may go to whoever wills. This alone is mine, the overflowing drop in the cup of my happiness. He has the men sew it up again careful and put it in his cabin along with the treasure chests. Then he picks me up and sets me on top of the bundle. Guard it with your life, Mac, he says. You cannot realize its importance to me, having never encountered Madame Kidd when thwarted of a desire. Oh, you lucky cat, you. It was touch and go to keep the old adventure galley afloat till we could make St. Mary's, half our crew being aboard the two prizes and the ship being short-handed anyway. The men had to take double watches at the pumps, which couldn't be stopped for a minute. But the thought of the riches aboard the Quedaw merchant kept them in good spirits, and they took their turns with hardly a grumble. Of course, the ship and her bulk cargo couldn't be divided up till it had been condemned and sold by an admiralty court, which would likely take a couple of years, but Bill decided to give the men their shares of the gold and silver then and there. If he hadn't, they would have took it, and maybe a couple of lives as well, so there really wasn't much choice. It took him and Brother Samuel two or three days to count and weigh out the gold and silver and jewels into even shares. There was forty shares for the ship and owners, Bill took none for himself, and one share each for the men. The men's shares, laid out in neat piles on the long table in the cabin, looked pretty handsome, worth several hundred pieces of eight each. As each man's name was called, he came in, swept his pile into his hat, and went out grinning well pleased and feeling he had a fortune. They were all mighty satisfied with their luck and didn't much care what happened to the ship and the rest of her cargo. Of course, the cards came out and the dice began to roll immediate. Long before we reached St. Mary's, all the shares had changed hands two or three times and half the men were no better off than they had were before the capture. The closer we got to St. Mary's, the lower I felt. Bill and the rest thought that our bad luck streak had broke, but I knew in my bones that it hadn't, only for the moment. I wasn't any happier either when we sailed into the harbor and suddenly saw a big frigate lying along shore. Bill carefully ran the adventure galley onto a flat, shallow sandbank, so when she sank, 
which she would do the minute the pumps were stopped. She wouldn't have far to go. The bosun anchored the Quedaw merchant nearby and came over at once, looking worried. Him and Bill stood studying the frigate, which didn't show any signs of life. The Mocha frigate, that would be, Bo says, Captain Culliford. Ah, uh, Culliford, uh, ah, yes, says Bill. Culliford is a pirate, a braggart, a liar, and a cheat, to name only a few of his lesser failings. He was my quartermaster in my early privateering days. I placed him in command of a prize, which, which he promptly made off to become a pirate. Uh, I suppose I really gave him his start in life. So uh, let us hope that he is duly grateful. Without so much as a by your leave, our whole crew, as well as the men on the Quedaw Merchant, had piled into the boats and were rowing over to investigate the frigate. Not knowing what to expect, the pirates had taken to the woods when we first came. Now they came stepping out of the jungle, whooping and calling to our men. First thing you know, they was all aboard the frigate. The rum was out, and they were singing and carrying on like a regimental reunion. According to my commission and instructions, I suppose I should capture them. Being pirates, says Bill, with a sour laugh. <laughs> but we seem hardly in condition to. The bosun looks around the empty deck, where the only ones left was him and Bill, Abel Owen, Brother Samuel, young Barleycorn, and me. Three men, three men, a boy, a cat, and that pill swallowing what is it, he calculates. We might be able to capture a canal boat if her crew was old and infirm. That's about all. We're in for trouble, Captain. We are undoubtedly, Bill agrees. We'd best prepare for it. So they ransacked the whole ship, gathering up all the small arms and stacking them in the cabin. Time they were finished, there were forty muskets and blunderbusses, thirty-odd pistols, and a pile of cutlasses and dirks. They brought in three kegs of powder, a basket full of granados, two casks of water, and a stock of food. It was almost sunset when they finished, and the cabin looked like an arsenal. Bill set Barleycorn and Brother Samuel to loading the arms and took Bose and Owen aside. Bosun, he says, I have one more task for you. I have here a small chest of the utmost value to me. It contains considerable gold and silver coin, my own that I brought aboard at New York. It also contains many orders and secret instructions from my employers, as well as my journal of this cruise. I would like it placed in Edward Welch's hands for safekeeping. You are familiar with the island and know where his house is? Oh, I, I know it well, sir, Bose says. It's about five miles back in the jungle. In about an hour, it'll be dark and the tide low, so Abel and I can wade ashore with the chest. We'll get it there safe, never fear. Good, Bill says. It's a comfort to know that there are at least two loyal men left me. Bose looked across the water to where the Mocha frigate lay. She was almost hid in the dusk, but the howling and carousing were going full blast. There are others, Bose says, a few that are loyal, once they get rid of their money and their thirst. But the most of them, when they run short of gold, are going to remember the owner's share here in the cabin. Then, look out. That will be the dangerous moment, Bill agrees. We are certainly well armed and sober, but we could scarce beat off an attack in real force. I, I, I've been thinking, the bosun says, and if agreeable to you, sir, I think that after we've stowed your sh chest safe at Welch's, Abel and me better join the other men. I've got some influence with the good ones. Perhaps we can stave off an attack or give you warning of one's coming. At least we can know what goes on and slip you word now and then. Bill agrees hearty. Bose and Owen each give Bill a bundle tied up in a handkerchief. Our shares, Bose says. We'd like to leave them with you, sir, for safekeeping. 
If we don't get to claim them by reason of slit gullets or the like of that, you might give them to McDermott here for his old age. The ebb tide had left us settled solid on the sandbank on a fairly even keel. When Bose and Owen let themselves gently over the side, the water only came up to their chests. Bill handed them down the box, wished them good luck, and they waded ashore. Then we settled down for the night. The loaded weapons were all laid out handy, and the heavy ports closed, making the cabin an elegant steam box. Barleycorn was to stand the first watch, Bill the second, and Brother Samuel the third. I stood all of them, being extra wash, watchful and sharp-sighted at night. The mutineers and Culliford's men were doing their carousing around a big fire on shore, but one by one they gave out and fell asleep. The whooping and singing fell off, and the fire gradually burned itself out. Then you could hear the night noises, frogs the size of pie plates croaking, bellowing crocodiles, hooting night birds, and forty billion kinds of insects, all sawing and whining their best. I judged that there was no danger of any attack that night, not in the state the men were in, but every time young Barleycorn began to nod, I sank my claws into his shoulder or chawed his ear and brought him up quick. That night, at least, passed peaceful. So, kid's in a bad spot. Lucky he has McDermott. We'll see what happens next time.